was up the last time we opened, I was the first to speak. And I believe the last time we closed, I was the last to speak. And so now we're reopening, I'm the first to speak. I'm not going to speak anymore. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so now that we, we, we've reopened, we're back in here. Um, it's good to be together, but I've kind of got mixed feelings about this because uh, we were just getting a kind of a rhythm of having people over our house on Sundays uh, to, to do the church service and breakfast together, and, and that, was, that was sweet. I can't wait till we can open up our Connection Cafe. That would be great. Um, so this morning, we continue this journey in the book of Acts, this amazing explosion of God's church in the, to the world. Um, God's Spirit, we see how God's Spirit is just moving the parts. He prepares this person over here, and He prepares this person over here, and He brings them together. Uh, we see that time and time again. And here is no different. Today, we'll see how God used ordinary people to plant an extraordinary church. You heard about it at the beginning of the service. And he's prepared um, Paul to come. And we'll get back, get to that in a bit. But first I want to take you back to Acts 1.8, which is kind of the, the uh, framework of the book of Acts. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be witness, my witnesses in Jerusalem, and all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And Charles Swindoll has done a great outline of, of uh, the book of Acts. And you can see there that uh, chapters 1 and 7 is the church being established in Jerusalem. Uh, chapters 8 to 12 is the church enlarging to Judea and Samaria. And starting in chapter 13, it goes to the ends of the earth. And you'll notice that uh, he, has, he shows a uh, transition between the evangelism, the Jewish evangelism, to Greek evangelism. And we've been seeing that in the past several uh, weeks, where the, the gospel is reaching into the Greek world, and the Jewish the leaders of the church are, are beginning to understand and accept God's movement. Um, and um, we'll, yeah, we'll leave it there. So pray for me before we begin, please. Father God, I do praise you. And I thank you for another opportunity to open your word. I, I thank you for the study you've given me. And I thank you for uh, the heart you've given us all to want to know you better, to want to know your word better. I pray that you would speak your word, use my lips to speak to hearts and minds in this room and online. Move in our hearts, move in our minds. Help us be changed because of your word today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts eleven nineteen. So, then those who were scattered because of the persecution that had occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks as well, preaching the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Now, I want you to notice that it says some of them were from Cyprus and Cyrene. That, that, that means that this was all one group going up to Antioch. Some of them went only to the Jews, but those from Cyprus and Cyrene went to both the Jews and the Greeks. And so you don't have two separate groups here. You have one group covering the whole gambit. Uh, these, these two groups um, were probably um, there in Israel, 
during, the, during Pentecost. Many of them probably were saved through Peter's preaching at Pentecost. These were the, those who were from Cyprus and Cyrene. We call them third culture kids. They were of the Jewish diaspora. They were, their families, for whatever reason, from, the, from whatever invasion in Israel that happened, left Israel. And they grew up outside of Israel, but maintaining the Jewish traditions and the Jewish religion. And so these, uh, these converts from Cyprus and Cyrene had an understanding of the Greek world probably better than this, those others who went just to the Jewish people. The God chased, has been chasing, is, uh, he, he brought Israel into the land, and he's been chasing them out ever since, and spreading them out, and preparing for this moment in history. He's got the Jewish community spread all over the world, He's got um, people primed to know what's the next great movement of God. And he, he brought in Alexander to convert all the language into one language, the Greek language, so that the gospel can spread easier. And now that we're seeing all of that come together. So as these converts as these ordinary people move northward, they uh, preach the word. The first point, God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. I would add one caveat there. God uses ordinary people who are committed to him to do extraordinary things. Those who were scattered um, went preaching the word. That phrase, scattered, uh, takes us back to Acts 8, 4. And this first passage, the first section, talks about how it's hearkening back to the persecution that happened after the death of uh, Stephen. This is the same time period when Philip is off doing his ministry up in Samaria, maybe a little later than that because it's a longer, longer distance up into to, to Antioch. Um, we're not talking about apostles who are sent out to preach the word. We're not talking about missionaries who are, who are being supported to go out and preach the word. We're talking about regular committed Christians who are being forced out of their home who instead of running with their tails between their legs like beat dogs, they're out using this as an opportunity to spread God's love, to spread God's, God, the gospel. And I think that's a great model for us also. I was in a, last week actually uh, at our house uh, when we had a discussion time after the service, I was asked, is everyone required to evangelize? And I had to answer the question, uh, yes and no. No, but if you're talking about evangelize as in stand in front of a big crowd and declare God's word, then no, we're not all required to do that. There are some people who are gifted in speaking to crowds. There are some people who are gifted in presenting the gospel. Um, there have been several people I've known who they seem to just have this gifting to leading, uh, leading people to the Lord. It's like they open their mouth and people listen and they respond. But I said, as a Christian, God's word should be in you. It is in you. God's Holy Spirit is in you. And as committed Christians, it should be coming out of us. We should be talking about it. We should be telling of our life in Christ. And that's the next point. This word preach, they went around preaching, is the word um, for evangelize. 
It simply means to bring good news, to announce glad tidings. It doesn't mean to formally stand in front of someone and preach the gospel. It simply means to give good news. And if you're a Christian, you have good news to tell people. So we're not all called to stand in front of, of large crowds and preach. But I believe we are all called. The Great Commission and several other areas in Scripture talk about letting your light shine. Tell people about your life. Tell people about the Jesus who lives in you. Peter's preached in front of thousands. Philip uh, reached into Samaria and then was called to preach to one person, the, the, um, the Ethiopian. God uses large crowds and he uses one-on-one -on -one meetings. As these ordinary, on fire, followers of the Lord went their way, they told people the good news of Jesus Christ. In other words, they preached, they evangelized. Brothers and sisters, if we have the spirit of the living God, the creator God living within you, living within us, then how can we keep that inside of us? How can we not tell people? But so awkwardly, it's awkward to tell people. Yeah, it is. Because we live in a world who is opposed to that. So it is awkward. But we should not be ashamed to talk about the most important thing in our lives. It's so easy to talk about the last movie we saw. It's so easy to talk about our, um, our hobbies, basketball or gaming or whatever. Why is it so hard to talk about that which is the most important thing in our lives that transformed us from the very core of who we are. I don't know. From this section, I want to challenge you with this. Let's make talking about our life in Jesus as common as everything else we talk about. Or should I say, um, well, I'm not talking about time. Don't, don't measure your time. Well, let's talk five minutes about this topic. Now I've got to talk about Jesus. I'm talking about in, in, in importance. Let's, let's include him, include our life as Christians in our conversations. Start talking like you love your life in Jesus and see what happens. God might just use that to draw people to him. These Jesus followers, they didn't have seminary degrees. What they had was the Spirit of God living in them. And the Spirit of God gave them a fire that they couldn't put out. They had to share. A couple of things. We also already heard about Antioch in the beginning, but there's a couple of points I wanted to make here. Uh, first, um, known as the Queen of the East, um, many from the diaspora of the Jews, they lived there, so it was just natural for the Jewish converts to go to, to Antioch because there's a large community there. As the video said, they're infamous for immorality. Uh, the there was a, the center of da, the worship of Daphne, who's, who, a goddess whose priestess, priestesses were prostitutes. Um, and it became the launching point. In fact, this church that's being settled right now became the launching of Paul's first missionary journey. Another important thing we need to keep in mind as we read, this is not Antioch of Pisidia. Antioch of Pisidia was a place where Paul went on his first missionary journey, and he found some success with the Greeks, but the Jewish uh, leaders 
chased him out of town, and they ended up chasing him to the, his next uh, stop in Iconium, too, and causing problems there. There was apparently a lot of cities called Antioch after the name of the, of the Roman emperor who, who settled the area. So moving on, at verse 22, it says, The news about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. And when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with, result, with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And considerable numbers were added to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers of people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Here the church grows. God grows the church in Antioch. News of God's grace in Antioch spread to the point that it reached the leaders of the Jerusalem church. Um, perhaps, well, several reasons. Probably they wanted to make sure that the, the gospel is being preached properly, that this, this new activity was, was within the the orthodoxy of, of what they were teaching. They wanted to encourage the work if it was, and perhaps if it wasn't doctrinally sound, they'd, they'd correct it. So they chose out Barnabas to go. Why Barnabas? Well, we'll see in verse 24, Barnabas was a good man. He was full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And according to Acts 4.36, Barnabas was from Cyprus. So he had a better understanding of the culture up in the area of Antioch. He went up there, he encouraged the people. The role of the church uh, leadership is to encourage people in their work for God, to make sure sound doctrine is taught, and to correct any error. And that's what, why we see Barnabas going up there. So Barnabas encourages the work. Barnabas uh, found the work of the Lord was solid and encouraged the people to continue. And through his encouragement, we saw a, see a large number of people being added, continuing to be added. But there was a problem. It got to the point where Barnabas needed help. And Barnabas re remembered this young man whom he welcomed into the fold, um, this man, pa Saul, or Paul. Remember Paul, uh, after being converted on the road to uh, Damascus, he comes to Jerusalem, and none of the disciples, none of the Christians would have anything to do with him because they were afraid of him, because of his 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 reputation and what he had been doing, except for Paul, uh, Barnabas. Barnabas took him aside. And I would imagine Barnabas had a little sit-down talk with him to verify God's work in his life. And then Barnabas takes him and introduces him into the apostles. And here, Barnabas says, I know just the guy for this job. Paul. Paul, he has spent way too long growing on his own it's time for him to get, it, get his feet into the work. And so Barnabas goes off to, um, where does he go off to? He goes off to Tarsus, Paul of Tarsus, of course. Um, and um, he goes. Now, Tarsus was no short trip. Tarsus was up and around the Mediterranean, and, and it took him multiple days, I'm sure, to do this trip. More than multiple days. When he, when he arrives, Paul and Barnabas spend an entire year teaching and helping this church grow. 
a lot could be said about, you can go off on discipleship and how Barnabas discipled Paul and how he gave him space to grow. And then when, when he figured he had grown enough, he pulled him into the ministry. We Sometimes we have this, there's this danger of, of letting people get into the ministry too early. You need to give people space to grow before you jump into the ministry. And then we're told this interesting little fact that the Christians were first, I mean, the uh, disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. I'd like to read you an excerpt from the, an essay that, essay that uh, Jacob wrote in the pass, uh, in, on this passage in a TICF newsletter because I, what he, he captures something here. He says, the term Christian is often derided today. When I was growing up, many people, myself included, stopped calling themselves Christian and instead used words like disciple and follower of Jesus because of the bad name that Christians had. However, this passage and others makes me appreciate where the name came from. The name attempts to describe a multi-ethnic group of people who follow Jesus. Christian, therefore, is a powerful and revolutionary term used to express our new identity as children of God and brothers and sisters to each other. May you be strengthened in your identity in Christ and be challenged to live out your name and, identi and, and identity to the world. I pray the world looks at TICF and says, people from all over the world meet at Yoe. There are so many ethnicities, passport countries, and home languages. What could they possibly have in common? What could we call them? And we shall respond. We are Christians. Don't be ashamed that you're a Christian. Christian is our identity. It's a, that, that uniqueness that God has given us as believers in him. Challenge here is as we see Barnabas encouraging the church and Paul. Can you click? Is it moving? Anyway, the challenge, if you could get that up with the challenge, the challenge is as Barnabas was encouraging the church, be encouragers. Be encouragers. Okay. So be encouragers. That's our, our second challenge. So the first challenge is, is don't be afraid to speak about your life in Christ. Second challenge is to be encouragers. Third section. It says, now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood, I mean, stood up and indicated by the Spirit that there would definitely be a severe famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And to the extent that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brothers and sisters living in Judea. And they did this, sending it with Barnabas and Saul to the elders. Here we see the church matures. This, this church plant went from ordinary on-fire Christians talking about Christ to having enough people that, that word got out that the church leadership came and tried to help them to form some kind of a, a, a group. And now, after a year of teaching, you have this, this famine coming, and they all independently decide, as the church, we're going to collect, make a collection and give money to support the church in Judea. Why Judea? I, I, when I first read this, I thought, if this famine is going to happen all over the world, then why are they sending it to Judea? They're going to get hit also. Um, but historically, we know around the year 45 AD, there's surely a famine 
during the reign of Claudius that hit, that especially hit uh, Judea very hard. Um, and we know that the Old Testament measurement for a prophet is he's got 0% margin for error, correct? 0% margin for error. So as soon as a prophet gets something wrong, he's off. They, they don't listen to him anymore. In fact, in the Old Testament, they would stone him to death for claiming to be a prophet when he wasn't. So when this prophet Agabus comes and tells them what's going to happen, they apparently find him trustworthy because they respond by this, with this collection. We see this prophet Agabus once more in Scripture, um, and that's in Acts 21, 10, and 11, when Paul, after his third missionary journey, is traveling back to uh, Jerusalem. It's Agabus who takes Paul's belt, ties himself up, and says, this is what's going to happen to you, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem. But did Paul listen? No. Paul, you can't tell Paul what to do. He listens to the Spirit. Um, it, it says each determined, oh, Agabus, and then it says each determined what he could give. According to individual giving and how God moved within their hearts of individuals, God supplied for the needs of the churches in Judea. This was not Paul or Barnabas saying, hey guys, we need a collection, right? We need to bring all this money together so we can support the churches in Judea. No, it, it makes the point that each person individually came up with what they could give. I believe our ability and desire to give to help others is a key indicator of our maturity in Christ. As this church matured, they started looking outwards to help others. I believe that as we mature, we will look outwards and do what we can to help others. You will love his children. You will help them. You will care for them. You will give of yourself. That's a mark of maturity. And then finally, the last point I want to make here is that um, the church of Antioch was not Paul's church. And it was not Barnabas's church. And we see that here and later on next, uh, when they sent him, them out. They were in the church. They were not leaders you know, of course they were leaders, but they weren't like the leader of the church. And we see this because Scripture says that they, the church, sent the collection to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Paul. So the elders in, probably that Barnabas and Paul had appointed, the elders of the church sent the money with Bar Barnabas and Paul to the elders in Judea. It's maybe a small thing, but Luke could have easily said, that Paul and Barnabas took the money to the elders. But he, he made the point of saying that uh, the money was sent with them. The church sent the money with Paul and Barnabas. And like I said, like, and later in chapter 13, we're going to see how this same church lays hands and sends Paul and Barnabas uh, and Mar John Mark on a mission trip. God uses this church in amazing ways. Paul spends over a year, Paul and Barnabas spend over a year, and he returns to this church after his mission trip to give a report. Paul and Barnabas put themselves, submitted themselves to the church. They, 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 they reported to the church. God works in people's hearts to provide for the needs of others. Second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Throughout Scripture, we see multiple times where it says love one another, care for love one another, share the burdens of one another. It's a mark of a mature Christian is when you're, you're thinking of one another. Are you mature 
to the point of caring for others, even though it might hurt a bit? Uh, there have been many here in the past and present here at TICF who, who put out of their own finances, of their own self, of their time to help others. I can mention several names in this room right now, I can, I, I, but I'm going to go back to Elder Alan Cosell, who, who he and his wife, Christine, gave so much to this church and, and to students. They put in so much of their heart and their life into the ministry. And when we say to the ministry, we're talking about putting their hearts into people. Putting their hearts into people. So I guess the challenge here is to care. Care for the needs of others. Don't just sit back and say, woe is me, I'm low on money, or woe is me, I'm having this problem. Get your eyes outside of yourself and say, I can do what I can do regardless of my situation, whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's effort. Um, you, can, you can put into others' lives. As Christians, we are united by the Spirit of God. We are made brothers and sisters, regardless of our background our, our, or any other distinctions, our financial uh, standing. We're brothers and sisters. We are the same in Christ. We are Christians. So let me give you those three challenges again. This week, I want you to think of these. Let us make talking about Jesus as common as everything else that we talk about. Let us be encouragers. And let us care for the, the needs of others. These three simple things, I think, would change the world if we would do those things as Christians. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for your love. Thank you for the ability to speak out for us all. I pray that you would bring the fire in our hearts that would not let us be quiet about our relationship with you. Help us to be encouragers, to lift people up, to <coughs> step out and care for the needs of others as, as we see. And Father, thank you for how you grew your church, and the gates of hell will not stand against it. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I encourage you all to please be standing as we do our response song. 